you don't really get smarter as you get older. But if you aren't in an insulin-resistant brain fog, you do accumulate more information over time. You might notice that whenever a world leader starts talking about peace, for example, a lot of bombs and tanks and killbots are going to be en route to a part of the world you never want to go to, and that you're probably tired of hearing about. You will be sent to a planet so mysterious, no one has even heard of it. Right! And those who have heard of it dare not speak its name. What's its name? Oh, I dare not speak it. That's the reason context always matters, and most of all the truth, especially the truth of history. I don't really care what any particular person chooses to do with their body and diet. Everyone has to decide that for themselves. What I do care about is promoting the truth and letting people decide for themselves, instead of having a situation where people are conned into eating fake foods and eating in dangerous patterns because lies are promoted over truth. Unfortunately, early history and prehistory are shrouded in lies, and this colors people's understanding of how their ancestors lived. And how we lived in the past is obviously going to have a great effect on what lifestyle is healthy for humans today. This is a big problem, because if you live a lifestyle that is not compatible with how humans are designed, you simply aren't going to be healthy or feel well. I don't feel good. Fluorescents uh, affect me. They make me feel blotchy. Swift Runner was a native Canadian tribesman. He was six foot three and quite muscular, a stark contrast to most people today, and the cause is probably not genetic so much as dietary, though lifestyle also comes into play. I chose him because I happen to know his height, but history is replete with people living natural lifestyles who are very tall and fit even though they had never heard of a gym, let alone lifted weights or gone running. History is also full of tribes that went from peak fitness and health to being full of disease and dying young. That is the curse of the modern diet and to some degree, the modern lifestyle. Even the few tribes living somewhat natural lifestyles today are hemmed in and unable to migrate as they once would have, and their populations have outstripped the ability of their territory to support them. This would have happened periodically in pre-modern times, but would not be the norm, and this gives a false impression of their diet and also their health, which is much less than it once was. The sand people in South Africa are often held up as the oldest people of the world, whatever that means. It's assumed they have survived in the same manner in the same location for at least 100,000 years. Their tribal lifestyle was famous for its endurance running based hunting method, where small game was run down after hours of grueling effort. However, there are many problems with this, such as the minuscule and emaciated sand people themselves, who are nothing like the hugely muscular people we find in the ancient fossil record, and the fact that Africa would have been a much different climate in the very recent past. The idea that humans originated in Africa traces back to Charles Darwin, and was based on the untrue assumption that Africa had much more diversity in animal life than other areas, due to observing large animals like elephants and lions. In reality, megafauna once thrived over the entire Earth, and Africa is just a holdout due to its remote and inaccessible geography and its climate which leads to dangerous pathogens like malaria. This kept the sub-Saharan African population of humans very low before modern medicine was invented and kept the ability of humans to overhunt to a minimum. In Roman times, lions were common in parts of Europe, and they were even abundant all over Greece until about 500 BC. The fact these areas lost their megafauna due to human overhunting should if anything indicate the opposite case. Like the Big Bang Theory, people are taught the name of the theory but not the details. Once you do know the details, which most people think they do but don't, it's mystifying how anyone on earth could believe such nonsense. Stephen J. Gold was a paleontologist who did not believe in natural selection. This was also a view held by Lysenko, 
the scientist whose work led to the Holodomor famine, and this killed millions of people in the 1930s. This is a view that has been absolutely refuted by all real scientific experimentation and observation, but it's still popular for political reasons. The idea that people have real genetic differences through anything but random mutation is simply anathema to those who have certain political views. The original Out of Africa paper had us the assumption that all human variation is random genetic drift built right into the paper. Genetic drift is very slow in general, and comes from a population size being limited to a small size for a long period, and this allows for random genetic changes to accumulate through a whole population. This is the real danger of inbreeding over time, and if you took a small group of people and stranded them on an island, eventually they would die out due to inbreeding depression because too many random genes were running throughout the genome. The Out of Africa paper claims that the differences between Asians, Europeans, and Africans all come from a very recent founder effect, followed by genetic drift of the European and Asian populations that just randomly changed them. So essentially, Europeans and Asians somehow randomly mutated in a very short time, but with zero natural selection. And yet, somehow, they didn't pick up any negative mutations along the way. And when you have genetic drift, you always have quite a few negative mutations, which we don't see any evidence of. Genetic drift is the same as inbreeding. So basically, they're saying that Europeans and Asians are inbred, and that's how they change to be different than Africans. And the Africans stayed the same. It's kind of illogical, and it just doesn't really hold up to the light of day. In fact, it's clearly impossible. First off, while there was no knowledge of genetics at the time, we now know that natural selection does exist. Not only that, but it is so strong that a single selected gene can sweep through the whole world's population in less than 10,000 years. The entire case for those against adaptation is long, long dead, and this theory should therefore be thrown in the trash can because it can't exist unless this idea is just simply wrong. The other big issue is that a founder effect and genetic drift are the antithesis of each other. Genetic drift requires very small populations for great periods of time to cause the extremely large amounts of variation between people today. However, a founder effect is the opposite case, where a small group moves to a new location with new resources and is able to rapidly expand its population. Since their population is not limited in a founder effect, there's no genetic drift, which is also just known as inbreeding. So you're just not going to have this effect where you turn into something different. The founder effect is going to promote these old genes. Like if everybody went to America, the first people who came to America, they were able to promote their genes a great deal because it's a fertile new land. And that's why you have Native Americans who are all very similar to each other. At the time that this theory came out, these were theoretical ideas. But in modern times, we can simply measure them with mathematics and plug in the numbers. That's because we can do experiments in animals and apply all of this to humans. So we can even look at what's going on in humans and see how much inbreeding depression you have in these groups that are isolated from everyone else. The long and the short of it is that the differences in people today can only be accounted for by natural selection and genetic drift over very, very long periods of time. While at the same time, we do see rapid worldwide gene transfer of particularly positive genes into all populations over time. So some gene can arise in Africa and transfer from town to town to town to village to village and get to Sweden eventually over hundreds and thousands of years without anybody from Africa ever going to Sweden. There's also groups like Neanderthals and Denisovans which contribute several percentage points to the human genome and they don't come from Africa. In fact, there's now about a dozen of these groups, many of which are ghost populations. This means we see them in our genetics, but we don't have any fossils for them yet. 
When we add them all together, that means about 20 to 30% of modern human DNA comes from outside of Africa. This is misleading though, because it makes the assumption that DNA never changes due to natural selection or genetic drift, and we know that's not the case. Once we realized that much of this ancient DNA would have been washed out due to natural selection and genetic drift, these populations could now account for all of our ancestry. There's just no need for any migration of any kind to explain our current genetic makeup. It's obviously largely been there for a very long time. The out of Africa theory is based on a faulty, long disproven scientific foundation with zero genetic evidence to back it up. In fact, the most ancient genetic data we have with what we call African DNA shows this African DNA in Southeast Asia 90,000 years ago. And it also shows Y DNA coming into Africa from Southeast Asia. And that's where all of the major Y DNA clades come from. There's only a few extremely rare Y DNA types like A00 that didn't come from Asia. And these are also found in other places too, such as Wales, which at the time it was found was not a genetically diverse place at all. To prove the out of Africa theory or even give evidence for it requires showing DNA anciently in Africa that exists elsewhere today but didn't at the same time, and we just don't have that. We do have plenty of evidence of the opposite, however, and we have much more ancient DNA outside of Africa than we have in Africa, which really only goes back a few thousand years and doesn't really say anything. We also have prehistoric cultures going into Africa over and over again for many thousands of years. This even includes Neanderthals and European Cro-Magnon. We also have tools found all over Africa and Eurasia that are millions of years old. The official story here is that all these other groups went extinct when Africans came out of Africa and randomly mutated into Europeans and Asians through inbreeding, not through natural selection, by the way. Even though the tools in these areas were more advanced and they had been inhabited by intelligent tool using human ancestors for millions of years. And keep in mind that this original out of Africa paper says that we came out of Africa something like 60 or 90,000 years ago. And they keep pushing this back because it keeps getting disproven because it's not real. <laughs> and of course we still have their DNA inside us, the Neanderthals, Denisovans, and so on. And due to natural selection and random mutation, the actual ancestry will always be higher than the number of genes that are an exact match for ancient DNA. And the longer the time period the mixture took place, the higher the difference is going to be. My father gave me about half my genes, but some of those genes aren't going to be an exact copy. This is going to add up over the generations to the point where you can't even see that really ancient DNA anymore just because it's mutated and evolved over time. There's actually more fraud in politics and the origin of man than there is when it comes to diet and health subjects, which is quite amazing because there's a lot of lies in that field. And none of this nonsense really stands up to close examination. It's just political propaganda based on ideas that have been long, long since debunked. Regardless, wherever humans were on Earth, the Pleistocene, aka the Ice Age, was a very cold time lasting about a million years, and this only ended about 12,000 years ago. So the climate in Africa, or anywhere else that our ancestors may have been, is going to be nothing like it was back then. The Sand People's method of hunting small game barely allows for survival, let alone being large and strong, and we know our ancient ancestors were large and strong. The game at that time was also megafauna, which humans could never hope to outrun. We also know early man did not run long distances just by looking at their skeletons, which would show signs of this. In fact, Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon barely moved around at all if we can believe this kind of evidence. We also know just how they hunted and what they hunted, and it's nothing like the manner in which the sand hunted. Now the sand haven't even lived on the savanna for some time now, 
and when they did this was only due to being pushed out of more abundant areas by constant incursions from neighbors, such as the Bantu tribes. They were not thriving as our ancient ancestors did, but on the verge of being wiped out. Fossil skulls with the largest brain size are all found around 20 to 30,000 years ago. Before that, the brain size of humans slowly went up over time. And with the advent of agriculture, it has gone sharply down again. It's important to realize that this holds true all over the world, whether Africa, Europe, or Asia. While there is personal and regional genetic differences, this fact points to nutrition as the main reason for these changes. For example, as I have said many times, taurine is vital for protein folding in the body. This mainly comes from small dark muscle tissue like the tail, neck, tongue, the heart for beef, and the thighs for chicken and turkey. Since we seldom eat these today, then if you have a child, or even a puppy, ensuring plenty of taurine is in their diet is probably a very good idea. If you don't have plenty of taurine in the diet, you can't make any tissue in the body properly, including the brain, and your child is probably not going to develop to its maximum potential. Okay, sir, this is to figure out what your aptitude's good at and get you a jail job while you're being a particular individual in jail. The human body can make a minimal amount of taurine, but requires a diet with plenty of nithionine in it to do so. This is mainly found in animal products. While using methionine is associated with homocysteine, for those who have good metabolic health, the liver detoxifies this. Part of that is through the creation of glutathione, which is mainly made by combining cysteine from methionine with dietary glycine. The supplement betaine can also help to detoxify homocysteine, but a healthy liver can do this on its own, while a fatty liver has issues. Interestingly, cats, which are pure predators, make no taurine, while dogs make more than humans. This implies humans are more carnivorous than dogs are. Humans also have lower stomach acid than carnivores, and much lower than herbivores. This implies that humans have been designed to both scavenge and hunt food, which requires high stomach acid to do safely. This provides yet more evidence about the ancient human diet. If you've ever been to a cold country like Canada or Sweden, you've probably realized that if the whole world were like that, then humans gathering large amounts of edible plants was just not possible for most of the year. For those still in doubt, thankfully we can actually measure what was eaten, and to a large extent see how much people moved around and what they did in prehistoric times. That's how we know that while humans did eat just about anything, they mostly just ate meat, as proven by radioisotopes found in fossilized skeletons. For those who think that human ancestors were emaciated vegan hippies, we can also measure how strong and muscular they were by looking at their bones. Surprisingly, Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon in Europe were much stronger than any human today, and even classical Greeks found in graves were as strong as modern Olympic rowers. While there may have been some genetic changes along the way, the fact that the common Greeks were so strong without a gym points to nutrition, especially when we see that, like the early men of long before, they were hypercarnivorous and ate animal products almost exclusively, something that only started to change around the Christian era, and even then it didn't change by much until modern times. It's really modern times where a mostly plant diet comes into effect in most of the world, even in Southeast Asia which is always associated with rice, this has come about mainly in recent times. With modern medicine and agriculture, populations have grown dramatically, while with communism countries like China have had chronic shortages for many decades, especially when it comes to animal products. The much vaunted Okinawan diet was also quite full of animal products before the war. Likewise, the healthy Italians Ansel Keys visited in 1949 were still living through rationing and eating much more processed carbs like pasta than they had before the war. 
Humans not only ate more animal products the further back in time we go, but they were also stunning physical specimens. If you have spent any time in the wilderness, you probably understand this already. Constructing a temporary shelter like a boma or lean-to requires relatively brief labor, but at full intensity. When you watch children play, they have short bursts of highly intense activities like running as fast as they can. Then they sit down and look at things, talk to their friends, wrestle a bit, get bored and do a variety of things that constantly changes. This kind of brief but intense activity is also what our ancestors seem to have done on a day-to-day -day basis which led them to being stronger and more muscular than most people today would ever credit. That is why you see massive specimens like Swift Runner, tall and simply full of muscle, while people today who exercise tend to do plodding exercises for hours, and even do weightlifting for hours on end. But this doesn't build up your performance to its maximum level, only this brief, very intense effort is going to do that, and only that is going to build the most muscle. In the long run it can even tear down muscle. In fact, when the 4 minute mile was broken, it was by someone who stopped running as much, and he started to do exercises specific to running that would improve pacing and performance. Muscle is the main protection our body has against excess blood glucose, and since today's diet has more carbs than ever, maintaining proper musculature is more important than ever before. The ingredients in animal products play a vital role in this and many of them simply cannot be obtained in the plant kingdom. Many of them are also lacking in chicken breast and even hamburger and steak. It's also important to realize that times of famine have been very common throughout history and prehistory. While native Canadians had the knowledge of pemmican making, Ironically, the hardest component to come by was sufficient fruit for the preservation ability of its sugar. So in the summer, in Canada, they would hunt many times the buffalo they could possibly eat, but they would be unable to preserve most of the meat. This meant that starvation in winter was very, very common. In fact, the only reason we have historical knowledge of Swift Runner is that he was so hungry one winter, he committed an atrocious act which I won't mention, just so we could avoid starvation. As I said earlier, Canada today is actually a good proxy for the climate of the entire realm 12,000 to 350,000 years ago. That means our ancestors were going through these exact same tribulations that the native Canadians were going through not that long ago, and they would regularly starve in the winter before the 20th century came along. There were many forms of hunting, but the most successful method for hunting buffalo was to drive them into a man-made corral of rocks. That way a large number would be killed at once, too many to possibly eat. This is also what Neanderthals seem to have done, and in general all hunting is highly seasonal. So now we know what our ancestors ate, and we also know how they ate. They tended to have a cycle of feast and famine. They likely ate as much as they could when they had the food, and then they were forced to fast the rest of the time. They did have some preserved foods like pemmican, but this was limited and precious, and they probably tried to save it mainly for the winter. Many times people will try to tell me fasting is unnatural, or that if you eat a carnivore diet, you'll never have to fast and you'll get all the same benefits, or that if you eat only f special foods like fruits and berries, you're going to be healthy and not need to fast. This is simply not true, and for example, nothing you eat will ever release a single extra stem cell in the body, like fasting can do. In reality, food is for nutrition. Red meat is the most nutritious food there is, in spite of endless lies being pushed by the government and corporate interests. The worst foods such as veg oil, sugar, wheat, and other refined man-made foods can also put you into an early grave if you eat enough of them, but diet alone can't do much to actually heal you. It only prevents more damage from occurring, and stopping those foods is probably the main benefit of both carnivore and a vegan whole food diet. One thing I see over and over is people switch to a keto or carnivore diet 
and their blood sugars don't get better for a very long time. That is what inspired me to make this video, as this is something extended fasting takes care of very quickly. While you shouldn't really worry about your blood sugars while fasting, because this just means you're getting healthy and you don't yet have to go into ketosis, it is a sign that you have a fatty liver and that more fasting would be helpful. And today most people do have a liver fat problem. In fact, you can't even get properly tested for it today because unless it's exceptionally fatty, your doctor will tell you it's normal. This is because it is normal for most people today. They all have fatty livers. This liver fat can take a long, long time to get rid of. But when you fast, it leaves the liver very quickly. This is because it's your liver that produces sugar for the bloodstream. And once glycogen runs out, it exclusively uses liver fat for this purpose until it's all gone. You can lose up to a full pound of liver fat in a single day through fasting. But many people, even those who appear skinny, have 10 pounds of more of fat in their liver. For the super obese, 30 pounds or even more liver fat is possible. Just keep in mind, you do need the essential nutrient choline in your diet in order to fully mobilize this liver fat and get it out of the liver. This is most commonly found in eggs, but is in other animal products as well. Another puzzling aspect of low carb diets is A1C scores. Somehow they often fail to go down or they even go up. There's a possible explanation available that eating animal products makes a healthier cell membrane, which could keep them alive longer and would artificially alter the levels of glycated cells. This may be the case, but while it seems like a good thing on the surface, it may not be if that's true. While the A1C score only looks at red blood cells, the real issue here is your white blood cells. When those become glycated, the CD45 proteins on their surfaces, which are what allow cells to identify friend or foe, become damaged. This can cause many problems in the body with autoimmune issues such as allergic reactions and even adult onset type 1 diabetes. Thankfully, fasting restores these proteins and kills off older damaged cells and creates brand new, fully functional replacements. Up to one third of all immune bodies are replaced by a single 72 hour fast. This is also important for aging as it is your immune system that repairs most of the damage of aging. If you have heard of NAD+, it is also your immune system which squanders all of this precious energy resource as we age. The immune system essentially becomes senescent and all macrophages become stuck in a pathogen fighting mode which requires vast amounts of NAD+, which is also required for DNA repair within the nucleus of cells. Fasting helps here in multiple ways. It creates new macrophages, which start off in the youthful repair state. It also helps old macrophages reset to this state, and it fights the root cause of this problem. This is the endotoxin LPS, also known as lipopolysaccharides. And these lipopolysaccharides trigger this change in macrophages. And so the ex experiment was done by uh, isolating uh, primary macrophages from mice, uh, growing them in culture, and subjecting them to treatment with a variety of these PAMs and DAMs. And what emerged is actually a pretty striking picture. We were expecting the DAMs uh, to do it, but we were surprised to find that these macrophages actually responded primarily to pathogen-associated molecular signatures. In particular, uh, one of them uh, drew our attention. This is LPS. This is lipopolysaccharide. Um, this uh, particular uh, uh, molecule, which is released by, uh, by gram-negative bacteria, is actually um, uh, one of the, the main triggers for the differentiation of macrophages into a unique form in the so-called M1 macrophages. These come from harmful gut pathogens that feed mainly on sugar and wheat in your gut. When you fast, these die off quickly, and if you eat a low-carb diet when you stop fasting, 
then they will be present much less in your microbiome. That is why fasting is the most powerful way to deal with this much talked about NAD plus issue. Though niacin and NMN can also help, and taurine can help a great deal as well. Likely even more than niacin and NMN can help. It is largely glycation that drives aging, which is why avoiding fructose is particularly beneficial for your health. A low carb diet will also help a lot here, but it is really fasting that can actually reverse the glycation and get rid of the old cells and proteins and replace them with new, fully functional ones. This is also why skin quality goes down with age. The collagen and elastin become glycated and useless, but fasting can reverse some of this. Taurine and glycine are helpful for reversing glycation and should probably be considered anti-aging compounds. When you eat, aside from the damage lipopolysaccharides from gut bacteria cause to your immune bodies, your immune system also becomes tied up in stopping the infiltration of gut pathogens into the bloodstream. Unfortunately, this means these immune cells cannot do their other job, which is fighting the effects of aging by removing senescent cells and glycation, and even removing plaques from the body. While many today will take vitamin K2 to help this process, if you are constantly eating this will never be triggered all that much in the first place. This is yet another area where taurine helps the body as well, and in fact it does so much more strongly than vitamin K2. People will also often tell me that they need CBD oil for healing, but by what logic would humans need an obscure chemical from an inedible plant as part of their diet? Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. In reality, these receptors are immune receptors that are naturally stimulated by fasting. While you can artificially get some of this effect by other means, it is transient and the only way to get lasting relief from chronic anxiety and pain from these receptors is by doing some fasting. People love to add in stuff to their diet or supplement regime, but they hate it when you take things away. However, this is the reality and it is going to have far more effect on mental illness symptoms and neuroinflammation which is present in all mental illness than any medication or supplement you could possibly purchase. Fasting is always the way to get real healing because it triggers the immune system to do this work and this is work that only the immune bodies like neutrophils and macrophages can do. When you go extreme low carb, people see issues like arthritis and digestive issues simply disappear. The problem is they come back the second you add the problematic foods back in. One bit of cabbage, bread, or whatever it is that you have a trouble with and you're right back where you started. With fasting, this does not have to be the case. Allergic and autoimmune issues start in the gut and they are continued by your immune bodies. Junctions in the gut tend to weaken with age, poor health, and with bacterial growth in the gut. Fasting will repair these junctions and so will nutrients like taurine and glycine, which are lacking in most people's diet today even if they eat plenty of meat due to the cuts we eat. Fasting will also resolve things on the immune side. Excessive amounts of activated immune cells will die off each time you fast until eventually if no continued response is invoked, the reaction will just stop. Fasting also stimulates the production of more Treg cells in the thymus by releasing stem cells in the body which travel to the thymus and become new immune cells. These cells are vital to your health and when they are gone you become highly susceptible to negative immune reactions such as cytokine storm. Eventually most people lose these cells with age but fasting can lead to the production of new ones. These will also regulate immune reactions in the gut and elsewhere to improperly digested amino acids which can enter the bloodstream through a leaky gut. That means it can suppress allergic reactions and eventually help entirely cure allergies. 
Though in severe allergies, obviously extreme caution should be taken, and you should probably only reintroduce the allergen in the presence of medical supervision. One big problem many people have going carnivore is stomach acid. Years of poor diet, aka the four food groups and the diabetes pyramid, or the even more atrocious food rainbow, lead to bacterial overgrowth in the gut and low stomach acid. In spite of medical doctrine claiming that you will die of scurvy, carnivore can slowly heal your digestion over time. Good lord, this can't be happening. By all medical logic, steam should be shooting out of his ears. But when you do some extended fasting, you can make dramatic changes very quickly. Though I mostly avoid sugar and oxalate heavy foods today, I could definitely eat my fill if I wanted to, and at least in the short term have zero issues. That does not seem to be the case with many people who simply eat a low carb diet and have had issues in the past. As soon as the diet changes, all of the problems come right back again. In essence, a low carb diet can prevent damage and can suppress symptoms of autoimmune disease but with fasting, you can simply get rid of many health problems for good. That's not to say there's anything bad about a low-carb diet, quite the opposite. A low-carb diet that makes use of the whole animal, skin and bones included, is exactly what our ancestors ate and what provides maximum nutrition. However, it's important to realize that our eating pattern is just as important as what we eat, and likely even more important. Our bodies have been designed to function in this manner, and they require periods without food for our repair mechanisms like autophagy, stem cells, neuronal growth, and nuclear DNA repair to be fully activated. If you give your body the right environment to heal, then problems that seemed absolutely insurmountable will disappear like dust in the wind. I'm relieved! That's great! I'm saved! <laughs> But still... No, well, what, what, what is it now? We're on a raft. There's no land in sight, I don't know. It's always gonna be something with you, isn't it, Joe? <laughs> <laughs>